How is everybody? Welcome to Practical Option Tactics. Tonight's class is going to be a little bit different. A couple of you guys have actually probably seen some of this on Monday uh, when I was with Amy's firm doing the same class. It's going to be a little bit different because it's a little bit less of education and a lot more explanation of the mini class and what's coming up. So you could almost call it a sales presentation. And those who know me know I really hate doing sales. So you can call this more of an explanation. I don't push anyone into sales whatsoever. As a matter of fact, a lot of people I talk out of sales. <laughs> they ask if they should take this class or that class. I said, you're not ready for it. Save your money. We're growing just fine with out pushing sales. I'm happy with where we're at. So you're going to see less ex um You could call it a sales presentation, but it's really more of an explanation of what's going on this weekend, plus a little bit of food for thought for those who do collars and a little bit of perspective of why collars are important, especially through September and October and what you may or may not be doing wrong. Some people think they've got collars mastered and you know what? It, it, it's funny in September's and October's is when we get all our growth, usually because the market's falling and people realize, wait, I was confusing making money with, you know, a bull market. So let's get started. First, I have to go into the disclaimer. It just says we're giving out education, not advice. You guys have seen this a million times. If the attorneys don't see it, they have fits. So we put it up there. And here is our schedule for October. I already mentioned today is going to be the collar class preparation. And Saturday and Sunday is the collars mini class that Amy Meisner and I are doing. Monday is Columbus Day. We used to get that off. We don't have it anymore. In case some other holiday, the day off. So it's going to be a full day of trading on Monday. Uh, Wednesday, we start our theme month. The following Wednesday on the 11th. Now, this is going to be a really important month for a lot of people. A lot of people have been really asking a lot of email questions and, and questions in classes and in Slack about really the best way to position themselves. They see all these trades coming in from pot. They want to know what the best trade is for them, what the best quantity is, how well diversified. Should they just concentrate on one strategy, two strategies? do all the strategies, et cetera. And that's what we're really building October on, is building your own trading plan based on your own personality, goals, risk parameters, risk tolerances, et cetera. Then the following week, we're going to have a class during trading hours where I'm going to be talking about trading plans, but also throwing up trades myself. And I haven't decided if it's going to be at the beginning of the day for the first couple hours or the last, um, the end of the day, the last couple hours. It really depends on how the market conditions are. Then we're going to be talking talking about the following week, building your own trading style. And then at the conclusion of the month, which is really going to carry over into the first week of November, which will be the November 2nd, is going to be allocations, how to allocate your capital. So it's going to be a busy, busy month. We had the Fed at the end of the month, which is really November 1st. So things are going to be really crazy, especially leading up until the Fed. This is going to be a big, big Fed month housekeeping now some questions came in from me to you guys regarding one of the trades we did and for those who are not in pot you have no idea what we're talking about bear with me we'll get to the collars i'm just doing a little house cleaning first but we did a pair trade we started a couple days ago and then i cleaned the last of it up today and I asked people, do you like the pair trades? Should I do more? You know, I, I'm not seeing a lot of questions about them, a lot of responses. Usually I get a whole bunch of emails about every single thing that I show. Every single example I teach, I show. People say, that's great. That's a stinker. I don't like it. Too much capital. How do I make it work for me? I get some form of feedback, positive or negative. Pairs, I got no feedback. So I asked everybody, hey, do you guys like these things? I mean, what I did is I entered a pair trade where I bought the QQQ call spread, sold an SPX call spread against it a couple days ago. The markets moved around up and down the last two days. And then I cleaned it up today, whereby the short SPX call spread, I turned into a long butterfly. So the risk is gone. And the long QQQ spread, I sold out four out of the six contracts, but left two contracts on. And essentially, I'm long two call spreads and three butterflies for a credit. I thought it'd generate some excitement. Nothing. So I asked people, 
do you guys like these? Should I continue with it? Or are they confusing you? Just not your cup of tea, whatever. And I got a whole bunch of different responses. And so I'm probably going to do one more pair trade tomorrow or Friday. And then if not, then I'll, I'll go into Monday or Tuesday, do one when it's set up right. And then if you guys don't like them, I'll move on to the next thing. There's a ton of different things I can show you. I love the pair trades. And as a matter of fact, I, I've told some of you guys this. When I was standing in the SPX pit and trading for a living, anytime orders came in that I didn't specifically have a plan for, didn't know how to clean it up, how to lock in a profit, didn't know what to do with it, I went and hedged it with the OEX and I turned it into a pair trade, SPX versus OEX. And it turned out that this was like probably my most profitable trades while I was on the trading floor. It was I don't, it, it could have been 50% of my profits every single year because it was so predictable. In up markets, the SPX always outperformed the OEX on a percentage basis and the reverse on the downside. So every time I was forced to buy options and I didn't like buying options, I always wanted to sell options. So anytime I was forced to buy an option in the SPX, I sold it against it in the OEX to get rid of the time decay. And then if the market went down, my puts went well. If the market went up, my calls went well. So so I love pair trades. There's a special little place in my heart for pair trades. And I'm a little bit frustrated and upset to this day. I'm still mourning the loss of the OEX as a product, but that's okay. The QQQ versus SPX is not quite as good, but it's still fun and we saw it. Now, I thought this would generate a whole bunch of excitement. This is our residual position. On the left, you see two call spreads in the QQQ that closed for about a dollar. We can sell them out and just collect the 200 bucks and be done with it. And three SPX butterflies that are probably going to go out worthless. But you got to remember the risk on this trade was in the, in the SPX index. We were short a vertical spread at the 3540 strike. So by being long a butterfly, even if it has a very small, small chance of ever making money, it does eradicate all the risk. And then you see the whole thing's been put on for a $22, $22 credit. We can make $600 on the Q side, and we can make theoretically $1,500 on the SPX side for a total of you know well over two grand. It's not likely. I probably wouldn't ever hold the SPX butterflies into the close if I can sell one out at a dollar at any given time. I'll start that and then sell another one at two bucks and play with the last one. So, but you could conceivably make six, seven, eight hundred dollars with zero risk. I figured people would love it, but I got frowns. I got that little pair trade frown. So we'll do another one later in this week or to start it next week. And if you guys want to scrap the idea, I'll move on to something more exciting. The other thing in terms of housekeeping, and I sent it out in the morning report and a couple pod updates is our YouTube channel is up. It's been up forever, but we never touched it. But now we're starting, we're getting the bumpers done. We have a little bit of sales pitch that you see here. The more people that participate in the YouTube channel, the more committed and dedicated we are to doing a good job on it. As soon as we get a thousand people, everybody who has and a thousand likes is nothing in YouTube world. As soon as we get a thousand people who like it, anybody who likes it is going to start getting free material. If you're in our database, you're going to start getting free stuff as a little thank you for liking and subscribing to us. It's also available on the phone app, and it looks like that on the left. What you guys have seen is me doing a little bit of temporary stuff in our Facebook account, which we also didn't really play with. I'm not a big fan of social media, but for a couple of weeks, I've been posting stuff in our Facebook account just to show, get a little bit familiar with the social media before the YouTube was up and running. And I started putting in a few trades to show people examples of long butterflies, short butterflies, selling butterflies into the clothes, Here's an example of a box, the sale of a box to open, the purchase of a box to open. And they're just little two, three, four minute clips that give examples 
to different types of strategies. And I told people I was doing it. I told people it's in Facebook and you can go look at it. It was just a way for me to get a little bit of practice really in recording all this stuff live without having to open up a GoTo account. Um, the YouTube channel is up. It's under Stratagem Trade. Uh, in every morning report for a week or two, we'll have a little link where you can get to it until everybody's used to the fact that we have it. The Facebook, we don't even really deal with. I, it's sort of just something that's dead media. We opened up an account when we opened up the company, did a couple things with it, and then sort of once a month just simply put in the pot schedule for the month. But that's all we did with it. But in the last couple of weeks, I've been throwing up trades of the day and stuff like that just so that I'm a little bit comfortable with the transition to YouTube. Again, it's the recording of stuff like this. This was, you, you can see the options moving. This is a recording. You'll see me in the next two or three minutes actually enter into a box trade, the sale of a box to make a you know profit. I'm talking my way through and saying, look, I bought the 4465. I want to sell the 4470, but it's not high enough to make a good spread. Can't do a butterfly. What are my choices? Well, you know what? Instead, I'm going to clean it up. Here, I'll buy the put spread. Turn this into a three-legged box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or I'll, in this case, I'm selling the put spread just so I can make a short box and be done with the trade without having to burn day trades. Now, and that's a really important concept for people who have day trade issues. And you're going to see I get filled here on the short put spread. And then all I got to do is sell out the 60 call and be done with the box and did the, sold the box for, I don't remember what it was, 515, 550, something like that. But it locks in a profit instead of buying a butterfly for a huge debit. And, and that was just a quick little three minute lesson lesson that I was explaining. I'm going to be doing a lot of little lessons in the YouTube account. So for you guys who are starting out, you're new, you want to see the beginning stuff that I don't spend a lot of time on in pot, or you just need something as a refresher. This is, you know, the YouTube account is going to be a great way of getting free little quick lessons on something you may be a little bit weak on or need a little bit of refreshing on. So here you see I did the box. Then I go through explaining why I did it, comparing it to the butterfly. I want if I sold the 70 call at 610, I would have had to spread in for a dollar seventy. And I go on and explain the rationale behind selling a box instead of making the butterfly that I would originally intended to do. But I didn't want to spend 30 cents for a butterfly that I didn't think was gonna go to those strikes. But I was already in the trade. I can't close the call out without executing a day trade so i turned it into a short box and made a small profit instead of burning a day trade or buying a butterfly that was going to go out worthless for too much money so there's going to be a lot of little lessons like that in there okay i just had it in facebook as a placeholder until the youtube account was up and running it was up and running as of yesterday i'm not going to do too much with it until next week after this collars class is over with in another class on premium selling. So let's talk about tonight's agenda. You're going to see a lot of the stuff that Amy and I are going to be talking about on Saturday and Sunday. And actually, this is a really cool class because this is the first time I'm doing a class with somebody else. I mean, I guess speak at a lot of places. I guess speak at Northwestern at University. I guess speak with, you know, Airmare and other companies out there. But I've never had a joint class where I reached out and talked to somebody that I really respect in this industry and said, let's do something together. Let's kind of break the paradigm of what's going on in this industry, try to create something a little bit different. I, this industry is getting stagnant or I'm getting bored. One of the two, let's figure out a way to spice up and make options education more fun. Let's do a class together. And so we're going to be bouncing things back and forth. And as a matter of fact, we were talking about doing a second class, if this one works out, where it's just going to be the Jeopardy game. You guys send in 100 questions, and they'll be under Jeopardy windows, and you guys pick what you want, and then we answer them that way. Something to make things a little bit more fun in learning. It makes it easier to learn when it's fun. But Amy and I are going to be talking about everything collars in the mini class, Saturday and Sunday. And why is this class so important? Well, Let's look at last year's SPX. 
from the start of the year until June, we were down 24.5%. Nobody even remembers that. Now, we did from there kind of bounce around, and by the end of the year, we were down only 20% with a big bullish 4% run for the second half of the year. But it was a scary year last year. And this year, even though the market's up 10%, it's not, I don't know if anyone feels like it's really a bullish year. I don't know if anyone feels like they were making a huge fortune being long the market. Because quite frankly, that 10% move higher in the market is really just a couple stocks. It, 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 it's a couple of the AI, artificial intelligence stocks, that are really all of the gains. If you took that out, the SPX would be down for the year. Most stocks are not up this year. Most stocks are down this year, even though the index is up 10%. Well, I'll show you. You got to remember, on average, there's a 10% drop in the stock market every two years. And there's a 10% drop in a day every two years. Here's the last 90 days of the SPX. It's feeling kind of, you know, bearish to me. We're down seven, almost 8%, 7.8% in the last 90 days. This is why we've been, Amy, me, a couple other people, all my friends in this industry are like, everyone's signing up for classes and, and, and bugging us for collars. You know, are you doing anything with collars? Are you doing, are you having any classes? on colors. Amy and I decided let's do one together. So why is it so important? It's because we are at the highest level stock ownership since 2008. 2008 was the first time in history where more people had equity in the stock market than they did in their retirement accounts or in their, uh, their homes. Excuse me, I said that wrong. People had more equity in their retirement accounts and in the stock market than they had equity in their homes. And about 60% of the population had retirement accounts. We're at 61%. After the housing bubble in 2008, things got all messed up. People got out of the stock market. People got out of homes. They're getting back into homes. They're getting back into the stock market. And now about 61% of everyone is in the stock market in one way, shape, or form. And why is it important for you to manage this yourself? The number one reason is the professionals suck. The professional money managers and fund managers suck. They may start out good. They get a good name going for themselves. They do have talent. They do have skills. They have a lot of knowledge. But what happens? They eventually go from a couple million to 10 million to 100 million. Then they're managing a billion. Then they're managing 20 billion. Their day is spent with accountants, lawyers, um, big client, marketing people, meetings, everything else. They're not even watching the stock market. It's hard to beat the stock market when you're not watching the market. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to manage it yourself. Warren, I'll talk to you about Warren Buffett in a second. But in the last 20 years, the NASDAQ's gained 665% and the S&P 500 over 300%. Most funds do not beat the underlying index. And it's mostly because of the 2%, 3%, 1.5% fees that they charge. And Warren Buffett made a bet with one of his friends. He said, buy any fund, S&P 500, QQQ, NASDAQ, whatever, and you'll outperform, or excuse me, index, and you'll outperform the best fund out there. And at the time, the best fund out there was the Vanguard index fund. They were the best performing fund back when the bet was made in 2008 or whatever. And so they were competing to see if the Vanguard index fund would beat the S&P 500. And over a 10-year period, the S&P was up 125, almost 126 percent, while the Vanguard index fund was only up 36 percent after fees. That's huge, guys. It's those fees and underperformance that make a huge difference. Warren Buffett and I are both advocates. If you're going to be in the stock market, do it yourself. If you're not good at stock picking, welcome to the club. Most people aren't. We saw that 82% of the professional fund managers can't beat the market. So just buy an index. The problem with buying an index, buying a stock, buying anything is that eventually the market goes down. And what happens when the market goes down? Can you stomach it? Most people panic and sell out, say, I'll just wait until this is done and then I'll buy back later when everything's cheaper. Why is it important to hedge your stuff? So A, you don't get squeezed out, but also in the last hundred years, there's been a recession every five years. Now, this time it's not gonna happen. 
because the people at the Fed said that there was no inflation, then changed it to transitory or transitory inflation. Then they changed it to soft landing. We will probably peak out in rates at the end of 23. We might even start lowering rates at the end of 24. Well, actually, we're going to start probably having the increased rates one or two more times. And it just keeps changing and changing. They haven't got one thing right. So eventually they're going to have to be right because a broken clock is right twice a day. So maybe when they say they're going to have a soft landing, maybe that's what they get right. I'm not betting on it. I don't... (laughs) Anyone who reads my morning report knows that I've been watching the Fed since I've been in this industry, and I can't recall a time that they've been right. I got in at about the same time Alan Greenspan got in, and everyone loves Alan Greenspan, but you don't remember the market crash within a few months of him getting into office. All these guys are wrong. Just like most fund managers can't beat the market. If you don't think we're going to ever have a recession again, if you don't think we're going to have a financial crisis, 2008, the S&P lost 38%. The Nasdaq lost like 60%. In the last 24 years, we've had three stock market crashes. Thankfully, I've been involved in four stock market crash. Well, five stock market crashes. The 87 crash and the 89 crash. And the Russian coup. Six crashes. I love crashes. But most people don't, especially if you own stocks. And the best way to not worry during a crash is to have a collar on. But there's a whole bunch more reasons why you should be in a collar. You'll get a copy of these slides. I'm not going to go through everything one by one, but you look at this graph of the S&P for the last 15 years. When's the next crash coming? I don't know. You could probably, actually, probably seven crashes I've been involved in if you count the the COVID draw. Okay, and we fell 50% during COVID. So here's COVID right here. So they're not even counting that. That looks like a crash to me. There's a lot of reasons, especially if you don't have the intestinal fortitude to just sit there and watch the market free fall and trust that in the long run, not selling is the best thing. And as a matter of fact, in the crash, you should probably be even buying more. If you're too nervous, if it upsets your stomach to watch half of your money go in a week, hedge or dynamic hedge, like I taught Peter X, where every time the market falls, you sell out your puts and use that to buy more shares. So you're dollar cost averaging without having to put more money into the positions. And we're going to be talking about that this weekend. Now, what's inside this class? A lot of people have been asking. I've been getting a lot of emails. The best way to address every single question that's coming in is through a pot class like this. Decide if it's for you or not. I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. We're going to sell out regardless if you sign up or not. But really, we're breaking the class down into six segments. Seven, because I'm adding an extra section after people's questions have come in. But obviously, when you start talking about collars, most people learn about collars from the married put. They get wiped out in a stock and they go and ask anyone, is there a way in which I can protect my shares? And someone will say, go and buy a put. Well, that's an expensive way. Okay, If you add up all the premiums of buying a put every single month in the stock, you may be spending 20% of the value of the stock on insurance. So if the stock doesn't go up at least 20% that year, you're actually losing money. The stock could go up 15%, you're hedged, and you still lose money because your insurance costs too much. So then you're like, "Ah, that's not working. How about the covered call? Let's enhance your returns. Well, the covered call is just a synthetic short put. It's not going to protect you in a crash, but it will enhance your returns. Eventually, you get around to learning what the collar is, and you put the married put and the covered call together, and you get yourself a collar. This is going to be the basics. We're going to cover this in probably the first half of the first day, just so everyone's on a level playing field. But even if you think, oh, I know married puts, I know covered calls, I know collars, I don't need this stuff, okay? We're going to be going into details, into the criteria, what expiration to put it in, what strikes, how far in or out of the money. Every stock is a little bit different. You can't just make a blanket statement, always sell a three-week-out call that's one strike out of the money. It'd be the dumbest thing in the world for a stock like, you know, NVIDIA. It may make sense in Disney, but not in NVIDIA. So there's going to be criteria on even these remedial things that some of you guys have probably never even seen before. We're going to also go over my five-year millionaire strategy that a lot of you guys have already seen. I'm going to go into great detail about it in a different manner than I've done than I have done in the past. 
But essentially, it's really, for those who don't know what it is, it's turning a collar inside out. Okay, when you're doing a collar, what are you doing? You're buying stock, hoping the stock goes up, right? And then you play with the options in case you're wrong. You're buying a stock you really love and you think it's going to go higher, but you buy a put in case you're wrong. Well, the put's too expensive, so you sell a call to get the money from the put back. And you make the determination that selling a call that limits your upside potential is worth it in order to get the put for free. And what you have on is a synthetic long vertical spread. You're long a call spread synthetically. That's one way to trade collars. Me, being a natural premium seller, loves doing it the other way. I don't care. I can't pick where a stock is going to go. I'm a little bit better than most people, but I'm not in any way a guru at stock picking. There's just some people that have a scalper's dividing rod for a femur where they look at a stock and they just know when it's going to go up and when it's going to go down. I'm pretty good at picking spots, but I'm not the best in the world and I don't want to be. I have told everybody a million times the hardest Greek out there is Delta. When we're dealing with options, we have Deltas, Gammas, Thetas, Vegas, and Rho. All but Delta are predictable. So give me a, a, a Greek that's predictable, like time decay. I know at expiration, there's no time value in the options left. So that's that's a good place to start. If I go out and buy AMD at 100, which you know got down to recently again, I love the stock. I think every time it goes to 100 or lower, it's a buy. But guess what? I might be wrong. It may go to 50. And now I'm waiting four or five, 10 years for it to go back to 100 just to break even. It's crazy. So maybe I'm not the biggest fan of collars because of the stock appreciation unless we're in a bull market but those options inside of a collar I can play with and so what a five-year millionaire is is we're trying to make money on the option and we're using the stock as a hedge it's the inverse of what a normal collar is and I'll explain a little bit more about it in a bit dynamic hedging we're gonna go into and Amy's got a slightly different bent on it than I do so you'll hear two different perspectives and then placeholder strategies. This one I just started with RTX in the last couple of weeks. Well, about a month ago. Uh, I've told everybody in pot class that I'm going to slowly start getting into collars for the rest of the trading year going into 2024. And really wanted to trade RTX. Anyone know what RTX is? It's Raytheon. Okay, they make all the missiles and bombs. And the one thing you can count on in this country is us always needing missiles and bombs. And especially with the Ukraine going on, I figured it's a natural. And I was looking at the graph and it was, wasn't sure if the stock was going to go up or down, but it looked like it was just in this like oscillation that looked like right before a big bang occurrence where it was either going to blow up big or blow in big and fall. And I didn't know which. So I wasn't real comfortable having a collar on because if we fell, do you want to own a call spread in a falling stock? Nobody wants to own a call spread and have a stock fall. And remember, a collar is synthetic stock. So, but I didn't want to miss it. I didn't want to miss the advantage of the move higher if we did blow to the upside. And so I put us in a ratio back spread. That is a placeholder for a collar. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the first day we're going to have Amy talking well, I'm going to start out the first day and we'll start out with a little bit about traditional collars. And then Amy's going to come in with the, her triple threat. The second day, I'm going to go into the five-year millionaire. And we're going to do a lot of talking about when to adjust a collar. For those who don't know what a five-year millionaire is, I'm playing with the strikes. Go look on the right-hand side of the screen in red. You see how the put is a little bit lower than the other strikes I would have selected for a collar or a call instead of stock or something like that. The call is going to be moved over too. I'm folding everything inside out. And we'll go into that in a minute. But people keep asking, why do you call it the five-year millionaire? Okay. It's kind of a gimmicky name, you know, but it was really what students came up with it. You know, most, the only name I think I came up with was Broken Wing Butterfly. I came up with the strategy. I'm the one who wrote the first book on the strategy. I developed it in the pit with one or two other guys. I called it. I was the first one and said, this is like a butterfly with a broken wing. And it stuck. And that's the only strategy I really named, I think, without like my students coming up with the names. And I know for a fact, let's see, Art is probably in the room right now. He came up with the dragonfly. So I want to make sure he gets the kudos for that. But the five-year millionaire student came up with because of the compounding effect. 
okay and it was one of these things where if you do it right you should get 10 percent interest a month now there's going to be months where you don't there's going to be months with small losses but under normal months or the good months you'll get 10 percent on your money if you set it up right and one student said wait 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 10 percent a month that, that's like a lot more than 120 percent a year i mean that like compounding and we and i said yeah compounding is probably three million and it's, I was wrong. It's like 3 million and 44,000 or something. But that's really how it came about. Now, obviously you're not gonna get 10% every month. Some months the market's not gonna do anything or it's gonna go against you. But if you get a third of that, because what does the market do? It goes down half a third of the time, stays flat a third of the time, goes up a third of the time, right? So if you get one third of them, it's a million. And that's how the five-year millionaire name came up. But people were asking on Monday, are we going to go and get the slides or the sheets and the spreadsheet and everything else? Yes. There is a step-by-step -step criteria for the five-year millionaire. Yeah, you, you're right, Lee. It came up a long time ago. You were there. There's a step-by-step -step process by which you go through. It's pretty much bulletproof. And the great thing about this strategy is it's not as difficult as it looks because you just follow the steps on the sheet. And before you even put the trade on, you're gonna know if you have a good trade or not. If you look at the bottom in the green box, you can quantify your total risk. And most of the time I get the risk down to 20, 30 cents a share or less. So if you pull up a $20 stock and you make 10%, what is it? Two bucks. But if I'm wrong, I lose 20 cents. That sounds like a great risk reward ratio. The great thing about this strategy is that you go through the sheet before you even execute it, because this will tell you if it's going to be a winner or not. It's a good candidate. So when you think about collars, most people think, well, just it's long stock and it's hedged. Some people who are a little bit more advanced close their eyes and can picture that top box and say, you know what, that's a collar. And they really understand that it's a synthetic vertical spread because really right there is the long stock. It's capped out right here with the short call where once you sell the call any further, the stock goes beyond the strike price. You're not going to make any more money. And then on the downside, your loss is limited because of the long put. It's a call spread. But then when you start going into triple threat and call instead of stock and you start hedging it, you get weird graphs that you're not familiar with. Then you get down to the five-year millionaire where you have 20 cents of risk to make two, three, four, five dollars. So every graph is not the same. When, you, when you're talking about collars, saying they're all the same is like saying all cars are the same, okay? They're not. There's a big difference between a Mercedes, a Tesla, and a Yugo, okay? Now, a question came in. What about rolling? Well, guess what? When do you roll a collar is the most important thing. I'm not gonna lie to you. There's not a lot to do with collars. You can set up a bad collar in a stock market crash and you'll be glad you had a collar on. Anybody can do it. Under normal circumstances, it helps to know what strike put to buy, what strike call to sell, what expiration to be in. Do you have the expirations the same? Let's say you own a put four months out and you sell a call four months out. Well, that call that you're selling is not really bringing in a lot of time decay, is it? Some people will bring that short call in closer to three weeks, four weeks. And then at the end of the expiration of four weeks, they'll sell another call and another call until they're eventually in the same expiration as their long put. And that's the better way to do it. But even if you mess that up and the market crashes, you're going to be glad you had a collar on. No matter how how remedial the collar is. Even if you put on the worst collar in the world, you're gonna be good. In a crash, under normal circumstances though, it's a whole different thing. And it's the adjusting of a collar that's important. And we're gonna cover, I'm gonna be covering the majority of that part, okay? Because we have to know when the best time to roll a collar is. When do we roll when the market moves higher? When do we roll when the market moves lower? When do we roll if the market's doing nothing? That is really the key to success on collars. That is probably 75% of doing a good collar. That is what, you know, my buddy Peter Ox mastered to get the returns he did on his collars. And some of you guys know Peter Ox. But um, it really is Frankenstein's bolts. And it's, you know, Cyclops' eye. And it is Dracula's fangs. That is... The key though, and that is if you're not really good adjusting collars, this class is for you. If you got this down, you may not need to take it.
Dynamic hedging is what I'm talking about, okay? That is going to be what we're really going to be focusing on the second day. And let me give you a little example of what I'm talking about. Here's a cashless teller in the QQQs. It could be NVIDIA, it could be IBM, it could be Apple, whatever. But let's say you go out and buy 100 shares of QQQ. We're close today. And you go out and buy the 354 put, sell a call, somewhat equidistant out of the money. And the call and the put are about the same price. So you have a cashless collar. You got a graph right there that looks like a vertical spread. It's a collar. It's your garden variety collar. Now you put the trade on for October 11th. Today's the 4th, a week from now. Because you're not sure if you want to stay in this or not. You'll give it a week. All of a sudden, you're in it for a week. We're approaching expiration. And... You're like, you know what, I'm I'm comfortable with the QQQ. I think I'll stick around. I, I like this a little bit more than the, the volatility in some of the stocks I've been playing. I'll play this name. But I got to roll it because my October 11 expiration is coming up. So a little while later, as expiration approaches, it's time to roll. And you look at your position and see that you're really essentially long a vertical spread at the 354, 365 strike, given the options you trade it and it's time to roll what do you do put in a, a roll okay you'll see what your most people don't understand is when they're rolling from one expiration to the other their hedges they're putting money into the trade thereby therefore diminishing their returns here you see a roll rolling just the vertical spread out is going to cost you money now think about it if a collar is a synthetic vertical spread, wouldn't it go to say that rolling a vertical spread out that's going to cost you money is probably going to cost you money to roll a collar too if they're the same thing, if they're interchangeable? If a collar and a vertical spread are interchangeable and it costs money to roll the vertical spread, it's going to cost you money to roll a collar too. Some people don't even realize they're spending money and eating up their returns rolling collars. So we're going to be focusing on rolling collars where we're not putting money into the position. Now, placeholder strategies, cutting in line. I was talked about the RTX at the start of this. There's going to be several different placeholder strategies we're going to be talking about. And why do I use placeholder strategies? A stock where I'm not really certain of what's going on. I want to be in rtx because it looks like it's going to move big or i want to be in stock because earnings are coming up and i expect a big move but i don't know if the earnings are going to be good or bad and if the earnings are bad i don't want to lose money by being long stock but if earnings are good i want to be able to exercise part of my tr position into stock and this is something i've not really talked about a lot in the past so this is going to be new, even for my diehard pot students who are around every single month for years. I'm not, I'm not talking about them that much. I wrote up a paper, a little article about RTX. I think it was like five, six, seven pages. I'll be happy to send it to everyone who doesn't have it. Just write the office and tell them you'd like a copy of the RTX paper. You know, it's just a further explanation of the trade we did, which is I'm going to show you right now. But there's a lot of different strategies we can use as a placeholder where we're not going to miss out on a big advance in a stock. And we did that with a ratio spread in RTX and guts would have probably worked out a lot better. But I picked the ratio because I wanted a little bit of a credit. Guts would have cost me a little bit of a debit. The guts would have worked out better. I didn't pick the right strategy because I didn't think the stock was going to fall 15% in two weeks, but it did. But here, this is what happened. I was watching this stock and for the last month or so, I'm like with the war in Ukraine and all the money that's going into the Ukraine and into the weapons that are going there. I'm like, these defense companies, some of them got to be making a fortune. And I was looking at RTX and they had a pullback. I'm like, and it had a pullback because of news that was related to a product that wasn't working quite right. But they always get that thing fixed, right? Eventually, these big companies, 
once in a while you'll hear Boeing or somebody screwed up and one of the parts on an Air 737 isn't working. They eventually get it right. Except for under the last CEO who dragged his feet, denied it, didn't handle it right. But eventually they get it right. And it doesn't stop the money from the government going into that company. So I'm like, yeah, okay, the stock took a big hit, settled out, and it's starting to vibrate faster and faster and faster, not knowing if it wants to go up or down. Maybe it's going to bounce. I didn't know. So on what you're looking at, the last day right there is September 8th. And I'm thinking, you know what? This drop here may have been the last puke, the last vomit of long deltas or people who just wanted to get out because you saw that afterwards it started going right back up. Maybe the next day it's going to start going up. That was my contention going into the trade. Well, I couldn't be more wrong. And I am wrong just as often as you guys are. I couldn't be more wrong. But, I mean, how cool is a company that makes hypersonics, or not hypersonic cruise missiles, super hypersonic. I didn't even know they had super hypersonics. But... We got into the trade by buying, uh, selling the 80 call and buying twice as many 85 calls. Okay. Do you guys see this screen? Someone's mentioning that they don't see my screen. Can you see my screen? With Okay, thanks. Okay, so you see the 80-85 ratio spread for 60 cent credit? Beautiful. Okay, I just want to make sure you guys weren't like frozen or something because someone said that the screen was frozen for him. Don't know what to say. Everybody else's computer's working, so I'm going to keep going. It's being recorded, so you can go back and look at it. Okay. So for whoever, for the person whose screen is frozen, don't worry about it. It's on your end. It's being recorded. You can watch this as many times as you like. Here you see the sale of the 80 call one time and the purchase of the 85 call two times, and it creates a graph that looks like you see at the bottom. Now, for those who aren't real familiar with the ratio spread, it's a real simple thing. You can think of it as the sale of a vertical spread and using that money taken in when you sell the call spread to buy a naked call. And that's what you want because you're going to lose a certain amount as the stock is going up on a short call spread. But after you get through all those strikes, the naked call can go to infinity and beyond. That's a ratio spread. And the graph is at the bottom. And we put it on for 57 cent credit. I tried getting it for 60, but we had to go down to 57 to get filled. And then I weighed it. I wanted the market to go up. Instead, of course, it went down. So right away, I was glad I didn't have the collar on. I, I'm glad I had the placeholder to the collar on where I didn't miss the upside. Because look at this graph. Let me back up. Right here. This is pretty much just a graph of stock. So if we go up, this call is going to start acting like stock anyways. If you want the stock, exercise it. But if you don't want the stock and we keep falling... You know, you're not in the stock. That's the thinking. So, from there, what happened? We wanted to go up. It went down. And not only did it go down, I, the only thing I was right about, the only thing I was right about is I'm looking at the graph and I'm thinking, this thing is going to move and it's going to move soon. And I waited until the last possible second to get in. And I got in at the exact day to get in. Because look what happened the next day. The next day, we fell hard. So I was expecting us to go up big or down big in the real near future. We went down big the next day. So I was half right. I was right on the time, wrong on the direction. And we just fell like a rock. And we got in on September 8th. And I, we got out on September 22nd. We sold the trade out for small credit. 
actually, let me rephrase that a little bit more accurately. When we put the trade on, we received a credit. We closed it by paying a small debit, much less than the credit we received. So when we closed out the trade, we still had some credit. Now, some people are asking, what delta are you typically using? It depends on the stock. Usually, I'm going a little bit in the money to play with the break-evens. So it depends on the stock. I can't give it an exact delta because you go a little bit in the money on a small, slow-moving stock, and the delta may be 80. On something like Raytheon, you go a little bit in the money when it's at 82. The 80 call may be only 58 delta. We're going to go through a lot of examples of in, in the collars class on Sunday, and you're going to see that it's about placement. The delta is less important. And then once you have the placeholder on, what do you do if you don't like it anymore? How do you wiggle out of it? How do you hedge this thing off? Well, when you have a one by two on, it's pretty close to a butterfly, isn't it? So there's a lot of things you can do with it. But let's take a look at this bad boy and why I like placeholders. And I have actually not been talking about placeholders enough in the pack classes. Look at the back ratio at the top. That's the one by two trait that we were just talking about, where we're short the 80 and long twice as many 85s. At the bottom is a traditional collar. And I made that graph with the 80 and 90 call. The 80 put 90 call when stock was around 83. So it was the lower strike and the higher strike. And I just used the prices that they were trading at at the time as a comparison to the ratio for people. And you see, that blue arrow is where the stock was when we closed out the trade. We closed out the trade when the stock was right there at that black line. You see that the placeholder, the back ratio, was actually up a little bit of money. Whereas had we been in the collar, we would have lost $500 on one contract. So if you like collars and eventually want to be in a collar, it's a good thing to be in a placeholder during the volatile times, especially when you're first entering the trade and you're getting your feet wet. You've been following the stock a little bit, but you're, it's a lot different watching a trade and then being in a particular stock and feeling the emotions of how that thing is moving around. In a placeholder where your downside is limited until you're comfortable jumping into the pool with both feet is, is one thing I like to do. And that's why I chose that over in, in Raytheon. Okay? And, and had the stock gone up, I would have exercised one of the calls. We would have then been in 100 shares of stock, and I would have hedged it off, and that we would have been off and rolling on our collar adventure with that. Instead, the market fell. Okay, now you want to see something really cool. Something better than what my grandma used to get me for Christmas. We did the trade again today. Okay, I entered the November 17th, 65.70. Remember, the original trade was the 80.85, but we fell. So now I can just move this ratio down to the 6570 and my break even is at a whole different price, a whole much better price. Here, let's look at it this way. Look at the green area that's shading right now. That is where you start making money. The original trade at the top didn't make money until just below 90. But after we fell, I put another placeholder on. The first one didn't work. We fell. I can get better prices. Now, 
I start making money at what? What is that? I don't know. It looks like about 75, 74. Okay. And what's cool is this. Look at that red line. That red line that just came up is where the stock was when we did our first trade. The stock was at 82. Today it's at 70. Okay, it closed a little bit above 70. So let's say you owned the stock from 82 last month. You're looking at 82 as your break even on the stock. But when you do the back ratio the first time and then you do the back ratio the second time, if we get to 82, look at the bottom graph. If we get to 82, we're going to be up a thousand bucks. That's equivalent to writing a hundred shares, ten dollars in our favor on a one line. If those people who buy stock and watch it fall in love, I'm not too worried about it. In the next five years, it'll be much higher. Here, if we get back to the original 82 price, we're not at break even. We're up a thousand bucks. Now, I had a question came in. It just said, do you ever enter via putback spreads or does the skew usually prevent it? No, you, you can do it through putback spreads, but there's an even better way if you want to utilize puts, and that is called guts. And like I said at the beginning of this, I would have been better off had I done guts, where I buy a call that's a little bit in the money, so it's kind of acting like a stock. And then I buy a put that's a little bit out of the money, but the put strike is higher than the call strike. And what happens? It ends up looking on a graph, sort of like a strangle. So had I known we were going to fall 14%, I would have been better off using guts because I would have had a put at, say, the 75 strike. When the stock went to 70, my put's five bucks in the money. I would have made a five bucks instead of making a little bit of money. Both of them performed better than the collar. Guts would have done made five bucks on the way down. The collar only made a little bit, like thirty-seven bucks. Um, the back ratio is sort of the poor man's strangle or straddle. Um, you, you could call it that. Guts is a more accurate definition of a poor man's strangle or straddle. And we're going to be covering guts over the weekend, too. Now, the last thing I want to talk about. Oh, did I buy back the original September 8th trade? Yes, it's expiration. Here, let me look for it. It's September 22nd. Um... I'll, I'll show it to you. I'm not hiding anything here. September 22nd, I think, is when we closed it. I'm getting kind of old. I mean, you know, I'm in my 50s. So I always got to double check this. Let me see. Yeah, here it is, the 22nd, I, I, I guessed right. I paid 16 cents to close it out. Okay. Remember, we took in 57 cent credit. Took in 57 cents, paid 16 of that back, so we're up 41 cents. Kind of cool stuff. Now, bank ratios, they're a little bit tricky because you have a little sinkhole. You got to time it right. You got to be in the right expiration so that you don't get into the sinkhole. If you don't like that, go to guts. 
And we're going to talk about guts, call instead of stock, or ratio, which one's the best under what circumstance, and how to choose which one is better for your trading personality and risk tolerances, and basically lifestyle too. Some of you guys don't want to be watching the markets all day long. Okay, I love this stuff. You know, I, I, this stuff is my hobby. I love watching it. It's kind of like a crossword puzzle for me. Other people, it's a means to an end. And they want to get really good at it, and they're willing to invest the time to become proficient at this. But once they do, they just want to trade to augment their income. Well, then we're going to decide between unbalanced guts, etc. And all that stuff's going to be described in a lot more detail than I have time for tonight. Okay, now, what else is coming with the class? We are having a third day, a bonus day. It will be a month from this weekend, give or take a week. We have not come up with the date yet. Why? I told you guys from the beginning, I want to shake up this industry a little bit. Every I started in this industry really at about the time the cab driver did. You guys know who, you guys who've been around for a long time know who I'm talking about. This is when me at Trade Secrets and Optionetics were all in their birth. And eventually around 2000 and five, six, somewhere around there. People stopped going to live classes as much as internet classes. It started, we started making a transition to internet classes. And I think I was one of the first ones to do internet classes, like pot type classes. Oh, um, let me think. Maybe some, I'm trying to think, maybe some other people were doing them occasionally before me. But I think I was like the first one to do them on a regular basis because nobody wanted to go into hotel function rooms and, and sit there all day long. We can do it from home. Plus, doing it online means the company doesn't have to rent hotel function rooms. So it lowers their costs, which allows them to lower the cost they sell. I mean, seminars used to be $6,000 for two days. They're a lot cheaper now because there's no traveling costs, there's no function rooms, etc. Even with the inflation, all our costs are passed on to you. Or and by lowering our cost, it lowers your cost. So that said, we're having a third day of Q and A, and it's going to be next month sometime. Um. What day we will let you know in the near future. It's really based on the questions. And I wanted to break up this industry's model a little bit. And Amy's coming along with the ride. She's very open-minded and excited about it. And what we're going to do, instead of having the third day where we just lecture, we're going to give you guys a month to play with the stuff we teach and send in comments, critiques, and questions and we'll build the third day around you guys. And we're just going to take all the questions and just share them with everybody and have slides already prepared to make it easier to understand the answers. But that's going to take a month for everybody to get their questions in, digest the class, maybe see it two or three times before they even realize they have a question. So there's going to be a third day to be announced that'll be like towards the beginning of November. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of five-year millionaire for those who've never had it before. For those who have had it before, but not in pot class, we're going to be sending everybody a pot class on the five-year millionaire. I've taught it in pot classes before. We'll send you a video on it so that you can get started, get a little bit familiar with it with the 90 minute class. But as soon as people sign up, they're getting PDFs 
of the class slides and the and the class itself. That's a given, right? After a class, you get the slides and everything else. But the bonus materials, there's a 30-page ebook on using a call instead of stock, the proper way of doing it. And you can go look online. We're selling it for $129 like it's water in the desert. People are paying $129 for it. We're giving it away. Why? It's going to save time and it's going to enhance the experience of this class. Five-year millionaire example worksheet. For you guys, I'm looking, there's a lot of Italians in this room. I have a lot of people. I have a big, big group of Italians that are like the most awesome students in the world. And, and I love going to Italy and teaching in person. But to make it easier, the spreadsheet has also got, if you look at the tab at the bottom, it's translated into Italian. And if it's translated incorrectly, don't blame me. I know like 20 words of Italian. <laughs> so <laughs> we have people in Italy that work for, with us. They're partners in Italy that work with us, and they did it. They do a great job, and they translate it into Italian. Um if there's a different language that's popular that you want to translate it into, we'll get it translated into that. But right now it's English and Italian. And then there's going to be um, a five-year millionaire workbook for, that's 45 pages on how to do it. So you're getting a lot of bonus materials. Now, as soon as people sign up, they're going to get an email that confirms it. It's going to say on the 6th, which is two days from now, you're going to get the links for the class and all the bonus material be included. But the other question that came in that needed to be addressed tonight is if you look at the flyers, it said the early bird special ended on September 30th. You can no longer get it for $649. It's going to be $749. Um, Aramare students and all my POT students and Amy students can pay the 649 up until the day before the class. Um, are the class recordings coming up? No, they're coming out. This is my project, okay, with Amy. Um, so it's all gonna be through Stratagem Trade. This has nothing to do with Air Mayor, even though I'm really good friends with Tom and I talk with Air Mayor a lot. This is a strategy project. All the stuff will be on our site, our server. You'll have the links forever um, where you can watch the recordings as much as you want. But they'll be available on strategy site, not Airmare site. So anyone that enrolls between now and, say, Friday can still get the $649 price instead of $749. That's as hard as I can sell, guys. Now you know why I became a trader, because it's a lot easier for me to sell premium. Like, I would be broke if I was selling cars. Any questions? Okay, guys, thanks so much. If you have any questions, let me know. Send me an email. I'll be happy to answer it. Next week in pot class, <clears throat> we start theme month. It's going to be it's going to be covering building your own trading plan. Something I've never done before, but is unbelievably important. I can't believe I've never just uh, addressed it before. Great question. Um. Someone asked, can you lose 5 to 10% a month using a strategy rather than making 5 or 10% a month on a strategy? And that was, I assume, regarding the five-year millionaire. There is a small, small, small window where you can lose money. It will be in the first day or two of trading. If everything goes wrong and you don't do anything, yes, you could lose 5%. You just sit there and everything that can go wrong goes wrong and you just sit there and do nothing, you can lose 5%.
once you get through that first day or two, or you manage the position correctly, no, you no, you don't have a five or ten percent drawdown. The key, and I'll I'll give you guys a little bit of insight into the strategy, okay? Because that'll better answer the question. If you take the normal distribution curve you have right here, most of the time with a collar, and let's say that's where the stock is, you're going to be buying, most people will be buying a put or a put spread right here and selling a call right there, where they're sort of equidistant from the center or where the stock is. Okay, they're trying to do cashless collars. They're trying to find a balance of the call to sell that gives them some upside potential on the stock, but still brings in money when you sell the call. And on the put side, they're trying to get a cheap put, but one that still provides protection. And usually they end up with something like this. With the five-year millionaire, the strategy is completely different. We're assuming we can't ever decide if the stock is going to go up or down correctly. 55% of the days the stock market is up, 45% of the days it's down. But So you figure, well, that's pretty good odds. I'll get long. We go down. You're like, well, we went down. Tomorrow we'll probably go up. That's the odds, right? Well, after six down days in a row, seven down days in a row, you can't take it anymore and get out of the trade. It's happened to me. I assume it's happened to a lot of other people here. But I'm assuming with the five-year millionaire, I can't pick direction. So what we do is with the put, we scoot the put down. Anytime we buy in premium, we go a little bit further out of the money than we would with a collar. And anytime we're selling premium, we're getting a little closer to the money than we would with a collar so that we're collecting premiums. It's a way of selling premium and using stock as a hedge. So one of the strategies, most people go out and buy stock to get you know into a stock or they'll buy a call. And if the stock goes up, they'll exercise their call. But some people will sell a put. <clears throat> You can sell a put because when you buy a put, it gives you a right to sell the stock. When you sell a put, you have the obligation to buy the stock. So if the stock sells off, you're selling a put that's going to give you the obligation to buy the stock at a lower price. But you're thinking, who cares? I'm buying it lower than it is right now. Well, what we're going to be doing is because we're always trying to sell premium, we're going to sell a put spread to take in money. Not a put, but a put spread. So it's defined risk. And hopefully the market sits or goes down a little bit and we actually end up getting assigned to stock. If the market falls too much, we could potentially have a complete loss on that short put spread. And then we're going to have the 5 to 10% a month loss. If you just watch the stock fall and fall and fall and do nothing about rolling your put spread or anything like that, yeah, you could have a loss. We're not going to do that, though. And what the cool thing is, once you're assigned a stock or you keep the premium from the put spread because the stock didn't fall, you can use that to buy the stock at a discount. Just go on, buy the stock, and then you hedge it following the spreadsheet criteria. And you're locked in. You can't lose money now. And then hopefully you're just rolling every single month and you can't lose after a certain after that first hedge. So you do have, in all honesty, a little window that if you do everything wrong, you can lose 5% a month. <clears throat> but it takes a lot. And you got to sit there and watch the car accident without trying to veer away from it. I'm not going to oversell the strategy. There is a little bit of a hole. Okay. It's well worth it, especially once you get through that first couple days. 
and you're in this position for month after month after month grinding out money i'd love to trade i'd rather have this than a regular collar makes more sense to collect five percent a month in premiums than hope that your stock is going to go up five percent a month Okay, guys, if you have any other questions, let me know. I apologize that this was more of a informative class than a teaching class on strategies and stuff. But with the class coming up this weekend, I wanted to make sure everybody had complete knowledge of what was going on. Weren't going in and signing up just out of loyalty towards me or Amy, but they had full realistic expectations of what this class is about. And I think there's a lot of sexy stuff in there for people, but I think really the non-sexy stuff is the important stuff. The the tedious rolling of positions as the market is just grinding around. Not very sexy, but that's where the meat of the profits on the collar is. Nobody wants to hear about it. It's not really cool, but that's the important stuff. And that's what we're going to be covering a lot of. Thanks so much for your kind attention. My pop people, I'll see you first thing in the morning. Hope to see a lot of you guys this weekend. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Someone's around almost 24 hours a day in our offices. Thanks again.